You spoke the words and all the worlds came into order. You waved your hand and planets filled the empty skies. You placed the woman and the man inside the garden. Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to assemble together in your name. Thank you for the love that has brought Christ from heaven to a cross, that he might bear the sins, our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who has come into our world and when we trust you into our hearts and our lives. Thank you, Lord, for 
the fellowship we experience, not only among ourselves, but with you, the creator of heaven and earth. Now, Lord, as we worship together, please open our hearts and our minds and our ears. We might see Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. We're going to be sharing again from Daniel, this time chapter 11. And unless the Lord redirects my attention, which he has once in a while, we have today and the next time we assemble to finish up Daniel. I hope, pray that God has blessed those of you who have been able to come and be a part of this wonderful book of Daniel. We have entitled this message, Foretold, Fulfilled, and Forthcoming. And I thought really long and hard, what would be a good theme or title for today's message? And so I want, to, want you to keep those three terms, foretold, fulfilled and forthcoming as we share from Daniel chapter 11. We're going to begin there in the first verse. And we'll read just a few verses because this chapter actually is a continuation of the revelation that we, that began in chapter 10. It happened during the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, God had already given Daniel a revelation or at least information about four great kingdoms of the world. And this would, these kingdoms would arise before the Messiah or before Jesus would come. And the first we read about is in Daniel chapter 2 and actually Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian king at that time if you were here you remember he was given this dream but it was also something the actual the message the interpretation as well as the dream was revealed to Daniel the prophet and then again in chapter 7 Daniel sees the same four the same four kingdoms. Only this time he's given it, you know, Nebuchadnezzar saw it from sort of the earthly human perspective. It was a great statue of various um, strengths and of various um, precious metals. But Daniel saw it from how it really is, from a spiritual perspective. And he saw them as great beasts, ferocious beasts. And these revelations in chapter 2 and 7 occurred between 606 and 536 B.C. Now in chapter 8, Daniel was given more detail about two of those kingdoms, the Medo-Persian kingdom, which was one kingdom, and Greece. And this vision was given while Daniel was still in Babylon. And Babylon was the dominant world power, and it was given during the last ruler over Babylon, whose name was Belshazzar. It was given in the third reign the third year of his reign. Now, I, I rem, remind you that these things were foretold. But after the fall of Babylon, the Medo-Persians came in 536 and Daniel was given more information about the future. Particularly as they related to his people who were, the, of course, the Hebrews. And this heavenly message was given to him during the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes. He was the Medo-Persian ruler 
in Babylon at that time. In fact, he was the one who came and actually uh, killed, had uh, Belshazzar killed. Daniel at that time was informed that there would be 77 year periods before the anointing of the Most Holy, that is, before the anointing of the Messiah. As already mentioned, Daniel received his final vision of the future world events in the third year of Cyrus. And that's when this began, chapter 10, verse 1, a third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And chapter 11, Daniel predicted that four more kings would rule over the Medo-Persian Empire after Cyrus. He predicted that. Now remember, when Daniel predicted these things, they hadn't happened. And Daniel also predicted some other things. And let's look at chapter 11. By the way, last time we shared together from Daniel in chapter 10, an angel was basically explaining the situation to Daniel. And that angel is still talking here. Verse 2, chapter 11. Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he gained power, when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Now, here, Daniel predicted that there's going to be four more kings who will follow Cyrus, and there were. In fact, he talks about the last king who is actually going to be more powerful than the other three kings that he's just mentioned is going to come. And this king is going to be one who stirs up everyone in the kingdom of Greece. In other words, he's a Persian king. He's, his name was Xerxes. We know him in the book of Esther as a Ahasuerus. So if you've read the book of Esther and you read about Ahasuerus, that was Xerxes. He was actually the one who took Esther to be his queen. All right? Now, he stirs up everyone against the kingdom of Greece, we're told. Then in verse 3, a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. Now, this mighty king is Alexander the Great. You know, Alexander the Great was in his early 20s when he conquered much of the world, all the way to India. However, within nine years, in his early 30s, Alexander died in Babylon. Verse 4. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of the heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Now remember, Daniel is foretelling something that happened now 200 years plus years after Daniel lived. And what did happen? Alexander the Great, as he predicted, as he prophesied, came and conquered the Persian Empire, became the dominating world power, but he died and his son and those related to him did not follow him because for one thing, they were done in. He had four powerful generals and those generals began to fight among themselves and eventually they sort of divvied up the Greek Empire into four regions. 
Now, in verse 5, two of those are highlighted. And we see the reason for that is because these Greek powers were most associated with Daniel's people. Verse 5, The king of the south will become strong. Now, by the way, the king of the south really ruled the area around Egypt. But one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. This one became the king of the north, as he's going to be called. And he was basically the Syrian. And after some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Now, think of, remember this. Daniel is sharing some things. And you say, well, Pastor, it, it's kind of confusing. I don't understand the details. You know, one of the things that God does in His prophecy is He spares us most of the time the complete details. And He does that purposefully. Because if we knew everything that, everything that was going to transpire exactly, what we would have a tendency to do is wait till the last minute to get our accounts settled with Him. And that's not how He wants it. God wants us now to be prepared. He wants us now to be ready for Him and to serve Him. And so the kings of the south are in reference to the Ptolemies who controlled Egypt. The kings of the north refer to the Seleucids who re ruled the territory that, of northern Palestine. And we notice that Israel is caught in between these two dominating powers. Now verse 6 predicted an attempted political alliance between these two powers. And under the terms of their agreement, the king of the north would marry the daughter of the king of the south at that time. And then their son would become the king of the north. That was their agreement. Now, the king of the south, who at that time was Ptolemy II, gave his daughter, Baroness, in marriage to the king of the north. However, it was only after the king of the north, Antiochus II Theos, divorced his first wife. You remember? Let's look at that verse again. Verse 6. They will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power. That is, the daughter of the king of the south will not retain her power. And he and his power will not last. How did that play out in history? Well, two years, Antiochus II did divorce his first wife and married the daughter of Ptolemy. But two years later, Ptolemy died. And what did Antiochus do? He took back his first wife. However, his first wife had her husband and Baroness murdered. What did it say? But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. Daniel, how did you know that? God, God knows. And God shared with him. Now the next several verses foretell the back and forth battles between the kings of the south and the north. Eventually, however, a Seleucid or Syrian king of the north, Antiochus III, also known as Antiochus the Great, gained the upper hand. And he took control, verse 16 says, of the beautiful land, that is, Israel. 
Because these two, the Egyptians and the Syrians, back and forth. One time that, this one would have control of the beautiful land and another time this one. But they were always fighting and they were, they were kind of in the middle. They were caught in the middle of these two struggling nations. Now the king of the south was forced into an alliance with Antiochus III about 197 B.C. And this alliance was sealed by the marriage of Antiochus' seven-year-old daughter, Cleopatra, to Ptolemy V. Now, before you, you know, start thinking of Mark Antony and all this, not the same Cleopatra. She came along later, okay? Not the same Cleopatra. But a seven-year-old was given in marriage to Ptolemy over the, the king of Egypt. Now Antiochus, the king of the north, thought his daughter could serve as his spy. However, turns out, history says that basically she was loyal to her husband. So it didn't work out so well. Look at verse 18. Then he will, return his, he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his, his insolence back upon him. And this, after this, he will turn back toward the fortress of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. Now, Antiochus the Great, even though he sort of uh, didn't, do well because the king of the south turned him back once but then he came back about 13 years later we're told in the intervening verses before the ones we just read he came back and was more successful this time and not only that but then he began to go up the coastland all the way up even into the area of Greece, as if he's heading towards Rome. However, we're told in this passage, a commander will put an end to his insolence. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, the Roman government sent one of their commanders with an army of 30,000 to stop him. And they did. And in fact, they were so successful that Antiochus the Great, or the Third, as he is also known as, they forced him out of the area and back into what is now modern Turkey. But they didn't stop there. Because the Romans, with 30,000 men, pursued him and defeated his army of 70,000 near Smyrna in 190. And he was forced to surrender much of his territory and military to pay heavy taxes to Rome. Now, again, we ask Daniel, how did you know this? Daniel didn't know the details. He just knew what we read. But these details were filled in as history unveiled. And Antiochus III, by the way, it says, remember, after this he will turn, his, turn back toward the fortress of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. What is he talking about? Well, when Antiochus came back humiliated, and went back home. He was murdered by an angry mob. And succeeded briefly, verse 20 says, by his son. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. So his son lasted a few years, but then we read in verse 21. 
He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. And after coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully and with only a few people he will rise to power when the richest provinces feel secure. He will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute, plunder, loot, and wealth among the, his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. And those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army be, will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation with flattery. He will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. And those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. And when they fall, they will receive a little help and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end. For it will still come at the appointed time. These verses tell us of the most, one of the most horrendous periods of Jewish history. It was under the rule of one called Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, Daniel's already revealed this man's character in chapter 8. Antiochus Epiphanes, the word Epiphanes, it's a Greek term meaning glorious one. And by the way, he gave himself the title, Antiochus Epiphanes. However, some privately, especially among the Jews, called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means the madman. Now, Antiochus was not the heir to the throne at that time. He was not the heir that was to be the Syrian or king of the north. But he seized it he saw an opportunity and seized it politically through in guile and deceit. Or as the NIV says, through intrigue. In verses 25 through 28, these verses tell of the successful political endeavors that he experienced. But in 170, Antiochus Epiphanes turned his attention to Israel, where he put down a rebellion and historically, he killed about 80,000 men, women, and children and then plundered the temple. Two years later, Antiochus Epiphanes invaded Egypt for a second time, but we're told that ships from the western coastlands, in other words, Roman vessels, will oppose him and he will lose heart. In other words, he was going to try to take over Egypt and he was being fairly successful until word got back to the Romans who were at that time beginning to rise in power. And they sent and gave him a great deal of discouragement 
And so he turned back. But this really agitated Antiochus Epiphanes. And so he vented his fury, we're told in verse 30, against the people of the Holy Covenant, that is the Jewish people and their temple. And yet we're also told in that same verse that he would show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. We know historically he did, giving them various uh, places of leadership, sometimes property and political positions. And verses 31 and 32 predicted the desecration of the temple in Jerusalem by Antiochus Epiphanes. On December 14th, 168 BC, history says that Antiochus desecrated the temple. He went in and he erected an altar to Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, and then he offered a pig on the altar of sacrifice. This is verse 31's abomination that causes desolation. Now those Jews who were unfaithful to God's covenant were rewarded, we're told in verse 32. But the Jews who withstood Him, some had to suffer. When it says that some of the wise will stumble, that word actually is suffer. They will suffer. But there was a reason that God allowed it. And this was to refine, purify, and make them spotless until the time of the end. One of the things that we need to understand, these Jews had to make a choice. They had to decide whether they were going to align themselves with the influence of man if they were going to go after the material and other sorts of worldly goods, or they were going to align themselves with God and follow Him and trust Him with all that they are. And remember what Jesus said, we'll remind you again. He said, don't fear those who may kill the body but fear the one who after the body is dead can destroy the soul or send it to hell. Now, foretold and fulfilled, these verses predicted that there would be faithful followers. And history tells us that during this time, a great Jewish priest named Matthias along with his five sons, gathered an army and fought against Antiochus Epiphanes after he had desecrated the temple. And although many Jews died in this uprising, their enemy was defeated December 14th, 165 B.C., and the temple was purified and rededicated. Daniel 11.35 indicated that this would be a time which His people would be refined, purified, and made spotless. But He also said, the end will still come at the appointed time. God's timing. Now perhaps some of us are wondering, well, preacher, I'm really not all that interested in ancient history. Well, I want to ask you something. wonder why God left this in his book for us to read? Have you ever thought about it? Even if you don't like history, even if you wonder, well, Pastor, I don't see anything, any way that this has to do something with me and you and those of us who are living today. I just don't. I mean, it made for kind of confusing reading and I just... I still, even after you have mentioned how it was historically fulfilled, I still don't get how it really makes any difference to us. Well, let's consider some of the relevancy as we close today. First of all, it demonstrates that God knows the future. 
God knows the future. God knows your future and my future as well as He knew the future of these events. God knows. And so things that come up in our lives that surprise us, have you ever had something come up as a surprise in your life? Just this morning in our prayer service, it was mentioned that there was a young woman of 44 years of age who recently died suddenly. She began to feel ill, and within a day or so, she was dead. She probably wasn't thinking about dying at the time. All of us have felt bad, haven't we, from time to time. Some of us have felt really bad. But let me tell you something. Her family was not only overwhelmed and saddened, but I'm sure they were absolutely surprised that this young woman passed away so suddenly. But you know who wasn't surprised? God wasn't surprised. Because for all of us, there is an appointed time. We read about it in the New Testament where God tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die. It is appointed to die once. It is also appointed that after that, the judgment. That sort of gives us a, an indication that physical death is not the end. Because if you're dead, and that's all there is to it, then why would we be concerned about a judgment? A second reason. It teaches us that God sets the boundaries of human activities. He talked about the appointed time. I'm reminded how God has given us a great deal of freedom to choose between doing what's right and doing what's wrong. He's given us a lot of freedom to choose whether to trust Him or not trust Him. But there are limitations to our freedom. You know, a lot of people, in fact, I've seen it in various school buildings as I was uh, in education, Say, so, you know, if you can believe it, you can do it, basically. That's not true. I hate to tell you that isn't true. Just because you think you can doesn't mean you can. Now, you can probably do more than most of the time you expect of yourself. But you can't do anything you want to do. All of us have limitations. They may be physical limitations. They may be mental limitations. They may be financial limitations. We're all limited in some ways. We can't always do anything we want to do. But we can mostly do more than we try to do. But God has limited us and not only has He limited us as individuals, but He has also limited political leaders and rulers. He has not only limited mankind, but even Satan responds to God's limitations. You say, how do you know that? Because if you've ever read Job, Job came and he talked with God and he said, hey, God, or Satan came and talked with God and he said, hey, I think I can get to old Job. And God said, all right, take him on. But you can't kill him. And you know what happened? He didn't. You know why? Because God wouldn't let him. You see, you and I, may experience some tragic things. And some of those tragic things may be because of other people and not ourselves. It may be because of our government. 
uh, as many Christians worldwide have been and are being killed because of their faith. But God sets the boundaries and they can do no more than He allows. We don't always know why He allows them to go as far as sometimes they do. But what we can know is that God is faithful and He does everything right. Nothing wrong. It shows us that the corruptions of others around us can adversely impact us. Think about this corrupt individual and these other individuals who were constantly interrupting the lives and ruining the lives of God's people. Things in our world can influence us and hurt us, at least temporarily, but not eternally, if we're trusting the Lord. It tells us that the Lord uses life events to refine, purify, and mold our character. Now remember, what are we talking about? We're talking about the relevance of understanding this prophecy and how we can learn from it. It reminds us that we must make a choice to follow the Lord God or something or someone else. Just as Joshua told the Hebrews. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You and I need to nail it down. We need to determine in our hearts and lives that we, for all that we are, are going to serve Him or not. But still another reason for the relevance is this text. We find in the latter part of this prophecy, we're going to get into that next time. But although the character and actions of Antiochus Epiphanes displayed a lot of the spirit that is described in this last part of Daniel's prophecy, he did not fulfill it. And we'll talk about that next time. But verse 2 of chapter 12 speaks of the resurrection. Resurrections, I should say. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now that hasn't happened yet, has it? Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to happen. It's going to happen just as surely as the history lesson we just heard today. And one of the great things about prophecy is it the fulfillment of that prophecy. And one of the reasons is important to us. One of the reasons is because it lets us know that this book knows what it's talking about. It lets us know that we can take God's Word even when those who seem to be in the know and in authority say that isn't so. This book has stood the test of time. And Jesus Himself said that not one jot or tittle will pass that won't be completed in this book. Now, question is, are we going to believe this book? Are we going to trust the God of this book? Are we going to give our lives to the Christ of this book who died for our sins and who's coming again? Or not? Let's pray. Father in heaven, dear Lord, I know this has been a difficult passage. One of many, one that is often overlooked by many Christians. Father, I pray that You will take the lessons that You have shown us and help us to relate to them. 
Help us to give ourselves to you with all that we are, with all our hearts and minds. Help us to recognize what you have done in our behalf in dying for our sins, in sending us your Spirit. And Father, I ask that there's someone here today who needs to turn from sin and receive you as his or her personal Savior. I ask that you might convict them, draw them, and save them. We pray it in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. the universe.
the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, thou art very great.